So there's this ambition, let's say this device, this kind of signal could unlock many of the mysteries about the early universe. Yeah. And so there's excitement there. So let's take it then further. I mean, there's a human story here of a bit of heartbreak. Not only was this possibly worth a Nobel Prize, if the Nobel Prize was given, you were excluded from the list of three that would get the Nobel Prize. So why were you excluded? Maybe that's a place to tell the story of Bicep 2. Yeah, so Bicep 2, like, you know, iPhones, or I know you're an Android fanboy, but, um, you know, every year they get a little bit better. They get more megapixels, they get more optics, triple X zoom, whatever, okay, right? We upgraded our detectors as well. The initial detectors were based on what are called semiconductors. They they have certain properties that make them very difficult to replicate at scale. And we wanted to make them into, uh, into superconductors, which had a virtue that you could then mass produce them. Why superconductors? Well, again, we're measuring heat. So one thing about a superconductor is that it transitions from some finite resistance to zero resistance <laughs> over a very short span of temperature range. That means you can use that very short span dependency as an accurate and sensitive and precise thermometer. And so my brilliant colleagues around the world, in this case, Jamie Bach, and nowadays Suzanne Staggs at Princeton, um, they are just exquisitely making these, these sensors, tens of thousands of them. The initial BICEP-1 instrument, of course, we just call it BICEP, uh, that only had 98 detectors. <laughs> Simon's Observatory is going to have 100 times more just in one of our four telescopes. We're going to have 60,000 detectors operating full-time at 0.1 degree above absolute zero in the Atacama Desert. We'll get there. But in the case of the, getting back to what BICEP did, we upgraded it, made BICEP 2. In January 2010, uh, we had just installed in the exact same uh, uh, um, location at the South Pole, in the same building, which is ominously called the Dark Sector Laboratory, DSL, still operating to this very day, um, we installed a new receiver on the same platform as before. It had very similar identical optics, cryogenics, vacuum, everything, except it went from 98 detectors to 512 detectors. So almost an order of magnitude, very substantial upgrade. Um, and it had certain other features that made it uh, even more powerful but than just a naive factor of five. Um, and then we started observing with that. And we knew we'd have years to go, and maybe we'd never see anything. Again, we're looking for these tiny little reverberations in the fabric of space-time produced close to the origin of the universe as we could ever get to. So I was playing a role in that. Obviously, it had upgraded my um, a version of the original idea that I had had for BICEP uh, with, along with Andrew Lang. And in January of 2010, uh, we were I was at a meeting at UC Berkeley and I got a call from Andrew Lang's, uh, or I was in a meeting with Andrew Lang's uh, thesis advisor, Paul Richards at UC Berkeley. And he said that Andrew is dead. He had uh, taken his life by suicide. And this is a man, and I'd already lost my father at this point um, in 2010, but he was like a father figure to me, Andrew. He would give me advice on marriage, on like how I should be with my kids, and, and um, you know, what was the most important way to move through the academic ladder. Again, he was preternaturally suited to win the Nobel Prize. Everyone always thought he would win it. He still, you know, if he were alive, he still could win it. In fact, his wife or his ex-wife won it, <laughs> Francis Arnold in uh, 2018. And, um, you know, it's just a power couple. And it, it destroyed me for a long time because, you know, he was, uh, he was just this magical person. I mean, I couldn't conceive of my career, my life, um, even like, you know, these, these aspects of, of raising kids and being married without him and to do it in that way, it felt like, again, I'm not, you know, he's got kids and I feel terrible for, for them, obviously, but it did feel like a betrayal. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. It felt like, why didn't the F did you not reach out? You know, I thought we were close and I couldn't, you know, I told him everything and I felt like he had told me everything. And now he was gone, and then inevitably we had to keep running the instrument. I mean, there's millions of dollars invested, careers at stake, young people working tremendously hard. And then here we were, and like, who's going to take over the lead? He was the lead of the project at Caltech. And then it turned out that the uh, other collaborators with whom I had been working for years and shared a lot of ups and downs with as well, they had you know, decided to form a collaboration in which I was no longer the principal investigator. I was no longer one of the co-principal investigators as I was on BICEP 1. So I continued on BICEP 1 as the co-leader of it, but not on BICEP 2. And, um, 
you know, obviously that was pretty painful. <laughs> this is all happening at the same time as you, as you lose this father figure. Now there's this yeah. kind of, so it's one betrayal in this, in a way, and then there's an, another, but or something that feels like a betrayal. Yeah. And he had, you know, kind of been the one, the only one looking out for my interest in the new experiment. I had moved from Caltech to UC San Diego and there were other postdocs in the mix, all of whom had come there to work with him to get the, you know, the approbation that would then lead to their careers taking off as it did for mine. And, um, you know, so there was a competition. I mean, science is not free from egos and, and, uh, and competition and, and, uh, and desires rightfully or wrongfully for credit and attribution. Was he the source of strength and confidence for you as a scientist, as a man? I mean, we're, we're kind of alone in this world. As When you take on difficult things, we often kind of grasp at a few folks that give us strength. Yeah. Was he your, basically your only source of strength in this whole journey? Like primarily in terms of like this close knit as a scientist, there were really two. There was one, this Russian cosmologist, Alexander Polnarev, who thankfully is very much alive. He's, it was at Queen Mary University. Now he's retired. <clears throat> he was kind of a theoretical, you know, cosmological father to me. And then Andrew was, was this counterpoint that was teaching me, you need to have a brand as a scientist. Every scientist has a brand and some of them don't protect it. Some of them don't burnish it. Um, but some of the skills about being a scientist, we don't teach our students involve how do you cultivate a, um, a scientific persona? And he was the exemplar for that. In addition to being the avuncular, you know, father figure type character that really, you know, was the person I would talk to. I had issues with, when I had issues with my own students and he would tell me how those were and he would tell me, you know, his misgivings about, <laughs> about people that he worked with or things in his personal life. And it was it was it was devastating. But again, like who the hell am I? I'm not his kid. You know, he lo his kids lost father. You know, it's so I feel guilty talking about it in that sense, but it's just a reality, you know. Well, there is something that's not often talked about is people who collaborate on scientific efforts. I mean, that's I don't again don't want to compare, but you know, it's it's sometimes when the collaborations are truly great, it sounds similar as when um um, veterans talk about their time serving together. There's yeah. there's a bond that's formed. So like comparing family and this kind of thing is, you know, it, it uh, is not productive, but the depth of the bond is, is nevertheless um, real because you're taking on something, you're taking on the impossible. You're, you're trying to achieve something, sort of like there's this darkness, this fog of mystery that we're all surrounded by, which is um, what the human condition is. And you are like grasping at hope through the tools of science. <laughs> and you're doing that together with like a confidence you probably should not have, <laughs> yeah. but you're boldly pushing through. And then for him to, uh, to take his own life, I, I, can, can I ask you about this kind of moment that combined, I don't want to say betrayal, but the, perhaps the feeling of betrayal that Bicep 2 kind of goes on without you, even though you're part of it, uh, you're not part of the leadership group. Can you describe those low points? Did you, um, was there a depression? Or was there um, a crumbling of confidence? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was so uh, wrapped up with my identity as a person, you know, like, there's only a few different ways to have identity and, you know, unless you're unhealthy psychologically, one of them for scientists is often that they're a scientist. And that sometimes is their primary identity. Now I've got other, you know, I'm a husband and father. Um, but, but, you know, at that time that was my identity. So to have that kind of taken away it, you know what, it reminded me of being, you know, kind of adopted <laughs> in a sense, like my, like the one who created me or that I had played, you know, played a role in my life that he abandoned me in the sense, it felt like these people are abandoning me. And the only thing I'd correct about the analogy that you use is like in mili in the war, they're all working, you know, for a common good. It's not like, I wanna be, get the most kills or even, I compare it more to like a, a band, like think about the Beatles, you know, and what they did. And then they like, you know, they ripped apart because of egos, credit, they had solo careers, they had, you know, re relations with their intimates and, and so forth. And, and there it's not only for the common good. There is more of a zero-sum aspect. Like I would say, science is not 
science is an infinite game. You can't win science. You never get to the, oh, we won science. And even the Nobel Prize, they don't feel like, oh, we're done. They feel like a lot of times they're imposters, even to that day. However, science is made up of a lot, of lot, of lot of finite games where there is only one winner for tenure. There is only three winner, are only three winners for the Nobel Prize. And because of that, I think it's heterodox and it, it's very confusing, especially there's no guide. I never got a guide how to be a professor, how to teach, how to lead a research group, how to deal with the death of an advisor, how to deal with an unruly graduate student or two, <laughs> you know. So we're all like reinventing it, which is kind of ironic and insane if you think about it, because the academic system that I am a part of and you are a part of is a thousand years old, dates back to Bologna, Northern Italy, 1088 or so, first universities were established. And, you know, very little has changed. There's some guy or gal scratching a rock on another piece of rock <laughs> and, you know, lecturing in front. And there's only one better aspect nowadays is that back then, the students could go on strike if they didn't like the professor, and then he or she wouldn't get paid. Probably mostly it was he's back then. Nowadays, that barbaric process has been replaced by tenure, so I'm okay. Uh, but, <laughs> but no, it was a definite kind of uh, feeling of the rug getting pulled out from underneath me because, you know, here's the, he was like my consigliore. He was a guy I, you know, sought counsel and counseled me, and, and he's dead. And I felt like there is no one who's going to honor the agreements that we had. And he was a very soulful person. He was so much better at being a scientist than I could ever be. And just a loss for the cosmos. It just really hurt. And, you know, I thought, oh, like, you know, it's so sad because he could have won the Nobel Prize. I don't think like that anymore. First, I think about his kids. Felt at first, now there goes my chance at winning a Nobel Prize. And hence the title of the book was like, I knew I would not win the Nobel Prize. It also means that there's parts of the Nobel Prize that have to be done away with. It's a double entendre. Like, we need to lose aspects of the Nobel Prize to help science out. We can talk about that a different time. But in the context of, like, now thinking back on it, that was such a minuscule part of it. Because let, let's say he did win the Nobel Prize, or I did win the or, you know, any of us did. Would that have changed anything? Would that have brought anything back? It's so, you know, we say it's like vanity. It's futility. And, and, and I just... You know, for me, the Nobel Prize is like, it's, I don't want to say it's like insignificant because obviously it has a lot of power and it has influence. 